Hello, 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 hello. My name is Elia Lefferts, and welcome to the Sons and Daughters of Encouragement Daily Bible Study. We have been going through the book of Acts. We are going to finish chapter 19 tonight, and that's super exciting. You can find us um, on the Kingdom Crew podcast, a weekly podcast. An episode just came out today, as a matter of fact. Um, today or yesterday, I can't remember, but just came out, episode 7, talking about how the church you know, we should look at ourselves. Are we elevating pastors rather than Christ in our churches? Just something to be thinking about at the church that, that you attend um, to be sure that Christ is the central message. That being the case, that's that. This is a daily Bible study for encouragement, for hope, give you a little something for your day, for your week, for your month, for your year, and for your life. So that being the case, let's jump in, man. Acts 19. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God. God, we appreciate everything, Lord. We appreciate you've even given us a, a chance to get up, get our, get our sorry selves up today. God, we're grateful for your mercy, for your grace. We come before you asking that you would encourage us right now, Lord, that you would breathe um, spirit and truth into us. God, we pray that you would speak your truth and that we would step aside our truth that we we want to cling to, Lord, and just, just go with you and just go with your standard. And we just pray that we would surrender to your standard, knowing that you are good and that you love us. And God, we just pray that you jump in here into this study, lead the way, and please fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, Acts chapter 19, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. So we will be in verse 21. After these events, Paul resolved by the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, sorry, and go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he said, it is necessary for me to see Rome as well. After sending to Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So the first verse, after these events, we'll check out yesterday's study if you want to see what those events were. But essentially, these uh, seven sons of a chief priest did not know who Jesus truly is. They did not know his true message of the only way to heaven through Jesus Christ. And therefore, they tried to cast out a demon <laughs> in Jesus' name, but they missed the mark. And uh, it, it turned out to be a great thing because so many people came and confessed and disclosed. They repented and they had a purging. It was a cleansing in the church. Well, after these events, Paul resolved by the Spirit. It's, it's hard to say when it says resolved by the Spirit. Some, some versions say purposed, purposed by the Spirit. So is it his Spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit? Well, look, we don't know. But all we do know is that this is his third missionary journey to plant churches for the first time in history. People are going around telling everyone about Jesus Christ and that he died for our sins on the cross for our disobedience as humans. He made a way to get us to be in fellowship with God in heaven if we would receive the gift. He rose on the third day, giving us a promise of new life. And when he left, and he will return, but when he left, he promised us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit can fill us and come upon us. We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we have access to the heavenly authority. Now, that being the case, Paul's trying to give this message, and he's usually run into a lot of opposition, but a lot of people are saved as well. So he's now got his journey figured out, going to Macedonia, Achaia, Jerusalem, and then Rome. That's going to be like the next few chapters. It's going to be that, that journey. So after sending to Macedonia, he sent Timothy. We know Timothy. Timothy is his, he calls him his true son in the faith in one of his letters. Paul wrote to, to, to Timothy. Um, anyway, he stayed in Asia, which is actually right about Turkey at this point, modern day. Well, verse 23, about that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. And please notice, way as a capital W. The way is the way of the Lord, walking in Christ. Believers of what Jesus Christ did on the cross who are walking in that way. 
well, it says there was a major disturbance. It's interesting that those two words are used, uh, at least the way it's translated in this Christian standard um, Bible translation, because although it was a disturbance, we're going to see that it wound up not really being much of anything at all. But it's very illuminating of our situation as humans today. It's the same thing, man. Almost 2,000 years later, it's the same thing as what was happening there. And, and, and that's the sad part. That's, the, that's us as a church. We need to illuminate this in our world and point to Christ. We need to shine the flashlight up there at Jesus. So anyway, verse 24, for a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. So what's going on here is Artemis, Artemis of Ephesus, Artemis of the Ephesians. So Artemis was their, their goddess, right? Lowercase g, fake, not real, their goddess. And this guy, Demetrius, well, you know, the temple of Artemis. That was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. That was in Ephesus. This is real stuff. This is history. This is not fairy tale, fantasy. This is history. So they had a temple dedicated to this goddess, Artemis. Well, this guy, Demetrius, he's bad news because he's a silversmith. He was, you know, but he's making idols. He said it's making silver shrines. He's making idols of this, of this goddess. And he's getting, he's providing a great deal of business for the other craftsmen. So he's looking good to them. Hey, man, as long as you don't say anything, let's keep making money, right? So we're not doing what's proper in, in the Lord's eyes, but we're rolling in it. So let's keep going. And everybody's happy with him. He's got some, some influence as we're about to see. Yeah, he's bringing them money. Woohoo. Yeah, right. Not good. Well, verse 25, when he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business. So he assembled the craftsmen, all their employees, and he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. Hmm. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, where they are, this big city, but in almost all of Asia, this man, Paul, has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. The very one all of Asia and the world worship. This guy's so full of hot air. Okay, so let's break you down here, uh, Demetrius. So look, guys, we need to be able to discern, come on, man, when we have the word of God in our hands, we can easily discern. The Bible says we'll be able to tell uh, by the fruit that the tree produces. A good tree produces good fruit. This is Jesus' words. A bad tree produces bad fruit. And so we will know about a man by what fruit he is producing. Well, this guy is producing some really rotten fruit. And so the, the problem is here. In verse 26, you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia. Why does he say that? Well, because if Artemis is such a big worshiper, uh, I'm sorry, if Artemis is being worshipped so widely, you can imagine that these craftsmen are producing idols, not only for Ephesus, but for the region. These guys are rolling in it, man. They're making bank. They're seeing dollar signs, dude. And so it's like, you see in here. Okay, well, this man, Paul, now he points finger at Paul, the enemy. Paul is not the enemy, by the way. It says he's persuaded and misled. This guy is so lost. The, he is misleading the people. He is in the process. His mouth is motor mouthing the actual misleading of people as he's saying that Paul is the one misleading them, the other people. It's, it's sad that people get sucked up in this. And why? Money. And what's money all about? What is that? Like, let's break it down. What is, what is this big thing about money? Well, think about it. Without money, there is fear that our physical needs will not be met, that our bills will not be paid, we'll, we'll have stress and trouble and difficulty with where we live and the things we have but also 
there's fear that we won't get what we want. And so when you have money and you're rolling in it, it's, it's not a sin to have money. I don't know why people think Christians are supposed to be broke. It's not a sin to have money. Joseph of Artemis was a wealthy man. I mean, I'm sorry, Joseph of Arimathea. He was a wealthy man, the Bible says. He's the one who took Christ's body with Nicodemus, nonetheless. That's a whole other story. And gave him his grave. Joseph of Arimathea, this wealthy man, gave Jesus' his body his grave. Uh, the grave could not hold our Lord and Savior, praise God. But that's what Joseph did for him. He gave him a proper burial. Abraham was wealthy. He had so much cattle and livestock, and he was a wealthy man. He didn't, that wasn't a sin. Job, Job was the wealthiest man around. He paid a huge price. And that's, again, that's another story because God is the one who said to, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Satan didn't start the conversation. God did. Very interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll dive into that another time. But the purpose of what I'm saying, Solomon was one of the wealthiest men ever. It is not a sin to have money, to be wealthy. The sin begins when you start being self-sufficient and placing all of your hope and your inspiration and your trust in the money and in the act of getting the money that you skip over the God who created the money, the God who created you, and the God who created the gifts and talents inside of you that enable you to get the money. So that's when the sin begins. Okay, well, that being the case, he says, Paul's misleading a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. Doesn't that just sound like silly to have somebody say, well, he's saying that that baseball bat I made isn't a god. You think? It's a baseball bat, man. These are silver idols of a fake goddess. They're nothing. The Bible says they, they cannot see. They have eyes but cannot see. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have ears but cannot hear. And those who worship them are like them. That's what the Bible says. So if you put your trust in an idol, you don't have ears to hear, you don't have eyes to see, you don't have a mouth to speak because you are being misled by the work of Satan. You're being misled by the work of Satan and he's laughing about it as well because behind every idol is a demon. That is heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. So be careful about where your trust is you know, it's interesting. God's always got a way of doing this. This morning I was in the car and suddenly the words Psalm 121 popped into my head. Well, this happens to me a lot. So I, for me, that's how God talks to me. Obviously he's spoken to me in his word, but you know, I don't hear a voice, an audible voice saying, Eli, Psalm, you know, no, nothing like that. What does happen is I'll be just going about my business and then whoosh, Psalm 121, a thought will appear. Well, I believe that's God placing that thought there. Psalm 121. So I opened up my Bible, Psalm 121. And it was one of my favorites. I had forgotten. It says, uh, I'll paraphrase, but where does my help come from? I look upon the hill, the hill of Jerusalem, where God is. And I, that's because that's the temple where God was embodying in the temple and in, in their, you know, in their perspective and the glory of God, right? And they say, I look up to the hill. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heaven and the earth. I trust in him. And then it goes around to say that the Lord protects us. The Lord will hold us. He will not allow our foot to slip. You know, this is very encouraging because the more you speak for the Lord, the more you stop playing around and, and get serious and realize that people's souls are on the line. People's eternal destinations are what we're talking about right now. We're not talking about that's what we're into. That's the business we're in is guiding people so that their souls can go to heaven instead of hell. That's, that's our business, right? There's no money in it for us. Uh, we don't want money. We want people to go to heaven. That being the case, man, Psalm 121 offers help from that opposition because as you move forward in that calling, 
opposition will come. Your, your target just got bigger. The devil has his crosshairs on you and he's watching you. Okay, you prayed, you prayed, you read your word. Oh, 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 you saw a girl, you started looking at the girl, bam, lust. Okay, oh my God, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, I'm sorry. Okay, and there's, there's Satan again looking at you. Okay, he repented, ah, ah, he repented. Okay, he's praying, he's praying, he went to church. Oh, target's getting bigger and bigger. You went to church, ooh, I'm gonna get this guy. Satan's burning, he's hot. I want this guy. Oh no, he loves his wife. Oh my God, no. He's, he's raising his son in the way of the Lord. Man, he's, he's on you. He's hot on you. But guess what? Who cares? Because God is protecting us. Hear me. That doesn't mean you can't have any kind of physical harm or sicknesses. That's not what I'm saying. God is sovereign and he can allow anything he desires. And it's always for his glory. But... We are not to live in fear of the attacks of the enemy because God is protecting us from that. We carry the shield of faith. So our faith is our trust in where the help comes from, the God who made us, the God who made Satan, the God who made the angel Lucifer, the morning star of light, who was cast down from heaven because he wanted to be like God. That's the God we serve, the one who created that being who is now here wreaking havoc. Well, when we put our trust in the Lord, it don't matter what's happening over there. Doesn't matter, man. And that's actually the next set of verses. That's what we're about to see. That's a great lead in here. So, you know, verse 27, not only do we run a risk, he's talking about business. Oh, our business is going to, we're going to lose business. Then he goes to religion, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised, blah, blah, blah. He might as well have said blah, 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 because it's a, just a bunch of nonsense. He doesn't believe it. He's just appealing to them. He's instigating them. Oh, our business, he's, our money, our well-being, our needs, our wants, that's in jeopardy. And then over here, he says, and your religion, the great goddess, the one we all worship, we, we're venerating her. It's like, no, man, they, He's nonsense. Okay, verse 28, Acts chapter 19. When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Man, we're lost now. He done stirred them up. So he stirred the people up. He appealed to their physical need, their physical desire. He appealed to their pride, their religion, their trust. And he got them all stirred up, but, but they're confused. If they're confused. Like, what's going on? This man stirred them up. What's happening here? Okay, so verse 20. So the city was filled with confusion. And they rushed all together into the amphitheater, which can hold about 24,000 people, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, a couple of guys there, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. So they couldn't find Paul. So they grabbed a couple of his companions and start pointing finger at them in front of everybody. But their confusion they're confused. What's going on? Because there's a tug. There's a tug. They know it's wrong. They know it's wrong. The tug is going, something's not right, but they, they ignore it. They're filled with rage. Our needs won't be met. I won't get what I want. So I'm filled with rage, but something's tugging me. Well, that tug is, is God. That tug is the truth. And unfortunately, God is not going to force his goodness on you. But Satan will gladly grab you and drag you through his evil. So think about that, man. God will extend his hand, but you got to grab it. The devil will find your hand and he will grab it. He will grab yours. And the, the Bible says you're caught in the snare. Oof, 2 Timothy 2, 22 through 25 or 26, I can't remember, talking about you're caught in the snare of the devil. Mm. Ooh, you Go check those verses out, man. That, that's the real deal right there. 2 Timothy 2, 22 through 25 or 26, I can't remember. Heavy. Anyway, they were confused. Okay, so verse 30, although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. He wanted to go in and, and fight and defend the faith and say, you guys are so wrong. 
he wanted to go, but he was held back by the disciples. And then we find out in, the, in a, a couple of verses later that even, even the, um, you know, the officials who, who were believers were saying, no, 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 they sent word, but no, don't let him go in. Don't let him go in. They, they, they had some sort of peace with the government in Rome of uh, Christianity at the time had some sort of peace with, with Rome. And so they were, they were like, don't disturb this, you know, like we're, we're okay right now. Well, listen here, man, even some of the disciples did not, okay. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia who were his friends sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. That's what I was just talking about. Verse 32, some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Oh boy. Oh boy. They're here. They're mad. They're yelling. These guys are yelling this. These guys are yelling that. And everyone's like, what's happening? There's confusion. There's rage. There's just a bunch of chaos is this not what we see today the the physical need i need my money i need my my wants i need my rent i need my bills the physical need those are real needs those are very real physical needs but god will meet them matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of god uh the kingdom of righteousness and then all of these things will be added unto you he's saying didn't didn't um look at all the lilies how beautiful they are they're more more beautiful than all of the splendor of solomon on his best day look at look at the uh the birds of the sky having no desire for anything i, I give them the feed and don't you realize you're more important than any of the birds i'm paraphrasing badly but that's matthew chapter six it's like come on guys god's gonna provide where is our trust psalm 121 do we put our faith in the lord or do we put our faith in ourselves and our fellow man? Because our fellow man, if he is not a believer, he's stirring up confusion by instigating our needs. Your needs will not be met. He's causing fear and strife. He's instigating you because he is afraid. He is afraid of losing what he needs and what he wants. So he's stirring up everyone else. Don't get caught in the snare of the devil. That being the case, they don't even know what they're doing there. So verse 33, some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, just some random Jews like, oh, well, what's going on? Um, after they pushed him to the front, you go, go, dude, you do it. And um, <laughs> motioning with his hand, no, 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 no. Alexander wanted to um, make his defense to the people. So basically, the Jewish people are monotheistic, one God, right? Therefore, they also say from Isaiah, from all over the Bible, no idols. There are false gods. Idolatry is not acceptable. So the people who are in confusion, this great mass of people in this amphitheater that holds 24,000 people who are all yelling separate things and nobody knows what's going on, it would be very easy for them to blame the Jewish people because the Jewish people are against idolatry. So here are the Jewish people pushing, man, there's so many layers to this. You got the Christians who are being persecuted for Christ's name. You got these other people who are now blaming the Jewish people and there's some anti-Semitism going on and they're not even the ones on the sides of the Christians. They're the Jewish people who are not receiving the message of Christ. So they're over here waving their white flag like, dude, it's not us. <laughs> Have you ever been that guy? You know, it's like you are the one instigating so many things. So then when something happens that has your fingerprints all over it and it smells like you've been there, your cologne is in the air. And then you're like, I swear to God, that was not me. Like, I promise you. Well, it sure looked like you, smelled like you, tasted like you, sound like you. Well, that's the problem. So these guys are like, no, 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 it wasn't us. Well, but when they recognized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. So now they're fighting. Now they're in unison. There was confusion. There was yelling. And by the Jewish people saying it wasn't us, that pushed the whole crowd to fully reject Christ in that moment. For two full hours, now they're in unison. The whole crowd is lost because of one dude stirring up strife among people who are afraid that their needs won't be met because their hope is not in the Lord. 
Verse 35, when the city clerk, you know, it says city clerk, but this is not doing it justice. He's literally the CEO of the city. He is the chief executive officer of the city. This, this guy, when he speaks, people listen. When the city clerk had calmed the crowd down, he said, people of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of the, Ephes of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell from heaven? Very interesting he used those words that fell from heaven because he's trying to pacify the people. And so if, if their whole argument is that Paul is saying that gods made by human hands are not gods and we're going to lose our business because of that, here's this guy saying, why do you even care? Because this came from heaven. Artemis came from heaven. This Greek goddess, you know, it's, a, it's not true, but he's trying to appeal. Come on, everybody chill out. We'll figure out who's right and who's wrong. But for now, everybody just relax. Right. That's the that, that's the place we're in right now. So he said, you know, he's trying to appeal to them when he says that. So verse 36, therefore, since these things are undeniable, he's like, you cannot deny it. Well, I can if you want to read the rest of the Bible. Uh, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. Chill out. Relax. For you have brought these men here who are not temple robbers. They haven't taken anything or blasphemers of our goddess. They're not blaspheming Artemis. They are speaking of the one true and living God. They're speaking of salvation through Christ alone, through Jesus Christ. Verse 38. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a case against anyone, if these guys are accusing the accuser, remind us of Satan, right? The accuser, that's what his role. He accuses us. You did this, right? He's accuser. Well, here's him saying, if Demetrius and the craftsmen, the accusers who are with him, have a case against anyone, the courts are in session. And there are proconsuls. We have a system for this. We have a legal system for doing this. And he said, let them bring charges against one another. Take them to court. Why are you guys doing a riot over here? He said, but if you seek anything further, it must be decided in a legal assembly. I'm going to get back to that word assembly. In fact, we run a risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today, since there is no justification that we can give as a reason for this disturbance. Well, remember verse 23 said about that time there was a major disturbance about the way. Well, here's this city uh, chief executive officer saying, guys, we don't even have a reason for this disturbance. If, if he says he has a reason, let him take it to court. This isn't, this isn't need to go like this. So he says in verse 41, after saying this, because by the way, if they were confronted by, by Rome about this rioting, they could lose certain um, freedoms and, and you know, things that they have. They could, they, those are risked. They, they actually do risk losing something by doing this. So he says, okay, after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Okay, well, we're going to talk about that word assembly real quick, but, but first... Remember what I said. I said earlier in this study that sometimes when everything seems like it's all happening around you, don't worry about it. I said, don't even worry about this opposition and the chaos and the mess from people coming against you in opposition, because sometimes you're better off just staying out of it altogether. Paul wanted to go in. It's our nature. We want to go in and guys, you're wrong. Christ is the truth. Jesus is the way we want to jump in. Guys, what are you doing? This is wrong. Sometimes. When other believers, right, when there's a clear message from believers, hey, hey, this isn't your fight, man. This isn't your fight. We have to listen to that leading because I'm a stubborn dude. I'm a bucking bronco. That's what I am. I'm an action guy. I'll think for a second. I'll take a look. I'll think I have all the information and I'll go. Oh, man, you don't know how many times I've ended up in some mud. Well, in this case, Paul wanted to defend and I completely relate with him. And they said, hey, wait, stop, let it. And look what happened. It worked out. It worked out through their own whole situation. It worked out. So it was not his battle in the first place. It's God's battle and God will work it out. That being the case, the last thing I'll say, and I'm, I'm running so late again today. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to cut these messages down, man. It's just hard man. I get inspired. But anyway, in verse 41, the word assembly, it says he dismissed the whole assembly. Well, that word, the word they use is ecclesias. I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, but that word, it literally means 
like legal assembly. It's often was used in the case of a legal assembly. That's the same word used for the church in the New Testament. That's the assembly, the church. So really what we have is we can correlate. And by the way, I got that whole, the, what I'm saying here about this came um, directly from Pastor Tony Evans' study Bible. He has some awesome notes on the bottom. I'm paraphrasing what he said in what I'm telling you right now. This legal assembly is what, what happens in the church. The church gets God's legal authority. God has a system. And so we have access to his legal authority. God is the judge. There is no question. And we need Jesus Christ as our advocate. He's on our side when God says guilty. Jesus comes alongside and says, wait, he's with me. And we enter into God's grace and glory. So there is a legal system and we have authority with it as the church. Amen. All right, guys, God bless you all. Let's have a quick prayer and then we'll, 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 we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, please, 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 in all of my ridiculous chaos in my mouth tonight, can you please make sure somebody got something that they can use in their, in their day here, Lord, that let them use it somewhere. God, whether it's, you know, letting chaos be chaos and, and letting God fight his own fights and, and knowing when to back up and then knowing when to speak. God, if you could give us discernment on that, knowing when it, when it is our place to stand up and say something and when it is none of our business. And God, if you could please help us understand that the chaos, that fear can ensue, reminds us that we need to place our faith and our trust in you. The Bible says, Psalm 121, I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord who created the heaven and the earth and that he will not let my foot slip. So God, thank you for your protection. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. And God, in your son's heavenly name, we pray for your continued unmerited favor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.